Hello, my dear friends. Previously, we had an in-depth inspection of Rapido Train's Thunderbolt. And the real thing, that's Lion in Liverpool. But what good is a loco without a train? We've got the engine, we haven't got a train. Oh, a passenger train. Today, we're not only having a look at the rest of the Titfield Thunderbolt train pack, but also the Wispeach and Upwell tramway car, as seen in the film. Have you been injured at work? I wasn't too happy with the bright, plasticky colours on the loco. So I'll walk you through some very basic weathering techniques I've applied to improve the look. On that front, let's start with Dan's house. Factory weathering has been applied, but it's had the effect of making it all look like it's been engulfed in smoke. Mm, I guess it has. It is unmistakably a model of the film prop rather than of an early railway carriage redressed to look like it. It's wider than a Liverpool and Manchester railway carriage and has the slightest curve at the base. Overall, a good interpretation of this unique piece of rolling stock rather than a simple recolor. The details do seem very flat, however. It's difficult to see where the doors and the air vents above them are, as they aren't very pronounced. Something else that's 2D are the curtains. It's disappointing that these are simply painted on the glass, rather than being behind it. So I think I'll set about changing that. On the roof oh no, is a hole for one of two chimney pots to be fitted, one raised, one lowered, as per the sequence in the film. A great way to have included this, in my opinion. Within the coach is a detailed base plate with poor Dan's personal possessions. I love the little mugs hanging from the shelves. It's hard to see through the windows, so having this detail all in colour is a lovely hidden extra. The manual tells me that the Laureate Y wagon that it sits on is one of only two of this design. And these details are accurately based on the one now preserved at the Seven Valley Railway. The details have all come out very neatly, but there's little to no metal to be found on either piece, which makes them both feel very light and plasticky. Even on a very basic test track, I did find that the wagon was derailing as a result. Next is the towed brake van. There's an endless amount of these already available in 00, so it would be hard to mess up. To make theirs special, this one has a removable roof and details inside. Again, it's virtually impossible to see this through the windows, but I suppose it's nice to know it's there. Rather cleverly, magnets are used to hold the roof in place, but this does result in a slight gap sometimes sneaking in. The cord along the roof seems a little bit bunched, but all in all, a noble effect. By that I mean there's no bell, like in the film, which really would have been nice to differentiate this brake van apart from just the number. Satisfactory. In terms of storytelling, there was a communication cord running across the train to the guard's van, but there isn't anywhere to fit one on either the brake van or coach. Understandably not provided, if anyone wants to recreate the train being held together with rope and chain, then they will also have to add that themselves. Lastly, the tramway car, which isn't included in the pack, but Rapido simply had to make it since they hold the licensing rights. This has a much greater sense of weight about it, and both the NEM couplings and bogies move very smoothly. A wise move was to have the delicate handrails at the ends not stuck to the roof, preventing snapping from being fixed in place. There's also an absolutely minuscule walkway that's hinged, allowing you to model two coaches connected, Inside is another full interior, most importantly including Mr. Valentine's travelling bar, as preserved on the one at the North Norfolk Railway. I would show you more, but I can't get the roof off. 
Rapido did make a video showing how to achieve this, but I don't have one of their magic pokey tools that they speak very highly of, and for now I don't want to go against their advice by using a screwdriver. The interior is again difficult to see from the outside, so I'm not really fussed about making any changes to it today. More on the agenda is dulling down the extremely bright colours. As with Thunderbolt, this is of course a novelty livery, but the shiny roof and plastic walls do make this look like an old Lionel model. Time to make some filth, starting first with the loco. Firstly, I dealt with anything that involved taking anything apart, which meant putting a more realistic coal load in the tender. The body shell comes off with four clips, with two screws holding in a weight block. Hooray. I pried off the plastic coal. Well, that looks much better. <laughs> Interestingly, the metal plate and rivet detail continues underneath. They must have known people would do this. I painted the coal space in black with a touch of white. I'm using real coal, so with a teaspoon I sifted out the smallest pieces I could find. With a matchstick I coated the area with clear PVA glue. And then sprinkled on coal dust as a base layer. PVA could again be dribbled on top before using tweezers to carefully place larger lumps. Doing it this way means I can easily remove or adjust the coal in future, but it'll stay put for now. Whilst that's drying, I pop out the wheels. Now in the film, Thunderbolt is literally in museum condition, so you'd expect it to be spotless and shiny like it was at the National Railway Museum. However, Lion was a working loco during the film shoot, and you can see it's got all the signs of grease and soot to say so. When it comes to weathering, I follow the idea that it has to have been exposed to dirt first, and then look like that's been cleaned away by tiny model people. With that in mind, a dark wash is used to get dirt into all of the hard to reach places. I've started with the wheels because if anything goes wrong, then at least they're hidden away. Next is the tender frame. I should note that whilst I've used this dark wash on model buildings, I've never been brave enough to try it on a loco. So I thought I'd try it first on the most expensive model in my collection. I'm applying the wash with one paintbrush, then with another using plenty of water to, you guessed it, wash most of it off. Plenty of paper towels were used to wipe away the sweat of my fear, but also to get the paint off the brush. Once it's more dry, I also use a cotton bud to clean the larger areas, leaving the paint to settle more in the corners and around the raised details. At this point, I'd like to give a shout out to G. Williamson Models for their fantastic videos on using washes in this way. Their models are outstanding, especially when you factor in that they're made with a camera in the way. This tripod is really bugging me. <laughs> I'm satisfied that the bright red is beginning to be toned down, but before I can apply the same to the loco, I need to fit the crank axle covers provided separately. Again, I figured that PVA would be strong enough to hold these, so these are carefully squashed into place. Thankfully, the detail pack does include two spares in case you lose any. I make my way around the loco in stages, leaning it on a pad of foam to protect the detail. I 
was particularly excited to see what difference the wash made to the wood panelling, trying it first on the smaller firebox sides. As I'd hoped, it sat comfortably in the gaps and left a nice shadow, really helping to separate each piece. It's a shame that the railings on the cab sides aren't raised more too. The smoke box is usually the most grubby looking part of an engine, so I've washed off less of the paint here. Next I'm turning to Tamiya weathering powders. I love these and particularly Set B and I spent a great deal of time together. I used the brown to coat most of the model, before wiping it away in places with a cotton bud. Especially lower down, dust and dirt kicks up from the ground, so the axles and frames are up all night to get mucky. I used the black powder more on the loco itself, especially around the smoke box and cab as well as along the top of the boiler to show where soot has fallen down. Whereas the dark wash stuck in hard to reach areas, the powder rests on raised detail like rivets. Another favourite of mine is Rustoleum and their painter's touch range which I'm using to colour in the clack valves on the boiler. I pick out some parts of the cab in brass like the whistle and the plate on the back head. For now, I'm happy with how those three steps have improved the factory colours look. So, onto the train. I started with the toad, presuming that the wooden planks could be done in the same way. I was more heavy with the dark wash on the frames because otherwise it is just a plain black plastic. Working from top to bottom means that the paint got underneath the handrails. I'm more unsure about weathering clear, large spaces like the roof, but obviously this is one of the places it needs it most. The removable element came in handy here, as I put the wash on and then held the roof under a tap. This made it settle naturally instead of leaving brush marks. Meanwhile, on the walls, I added a very light shade of grey to brighten the centres of each panel again. Something convenient is that not only are there reference photos of brake vans to see how they weather, but in this case there's also colour footage of how this one appeared on screen. There's sprays of mud at each end from the wheels. So using orange rust and brown powders, I line these out with a sponge. The buffers are dusted with silver and gunmetal to give them some reflective qualities before darker, rusty colours are added on top. The manual says that the coach separates with two clips, but it doesn't seem like it. It seemed partially glued to the base. I'd like it removable anyway, so I sanded down the top of the wagon and took out the interior. I'm going to try to remake the windows, but having them out helps with weathering anyway. Taking the glass out was done very carefully because the plastic does seem very thin. Game over if it snaps, which it did not. Once again, black wash going over the factory weathering. Then a full dusting with brown powder. The prop is quite grotty in the film, and given that it had been left in a field, I figured adding some green around the base would be more suitable. I cut out some card and traced the rough shape of the existing curtains, leaving enough room at the bottom to stick them on. Then using a scalpel, I scored lines across to imitate the ruffles. I scraped away some of these lines before scrumpling up the card a bit. I would have used actual fabric for this, but I don't think it would have looked convincing at this scale. 
Using white and a touch of yellow, these pieces were then painted so that they wouldn't look paper coloured. Because they were. The prototype has a small green and red floral design. So using the end of a cocktail stick, I dabbed on a pattern. Then each piece was lightly dusted with black weathering powder. Glass was provided by some offcuts of an old plastic box. And fixed in with tiny dots of super glue. Any more and it'll stain the glass itself. But this also means it's easy to remove in future. The curtains are then glued to the back of these each at slightly different angles so that they're not all uniform. It does look a bit like a Punch and Judy stage show, but I am pleased with how the new windows look over the originals. Lastly, the bar car. Since I can't get the roof off and I'm not wanting to replace the windows or interior, I'm happy to just leave, I'm happy to just use the weathering powders for this one. Pretty much everything is coated the windows being cleaned afterwards with cotton. The car is actually quite cleanly turned out in the film, so I just wanted to show where new dirt has gathered over its recent journeys. Lower down than most other coaches, I reckon that the roof would get seen quite a lot. So I went all at it with brown and black powders. Again, some patches were then cleaned, and a trail of black left down the centre imitates where the loco smoke has settled. And there we have it, a complete Titfield train. Perhaps following the events of the film, the tramway car is salvaged and put back into use, alongside Dan's house while he's in prison, to cater for the surgeon passengers. Thunderbolt has to strike on whilst a new loco is found. And so, the story continues on in the imagination through these miniatures. These are now crying out for a diorama to sit on. So subscribe and do tell me in the comments if more model videos is something you'd like to see. I hope this two part video has been useful to show you what can be done to improve the look of a model with very minimal materials. Weathering this way is still something I'm on the road to learn myself. So it's been lovely to share some of that with you. Thank you to all of my supporters on Patreon for making this video possible. If you'd like to become one of them, then the link is in the description to get a whole bunch of perks. Thanks of course to Rapido Trains for making the Tipfield Thunderbolt ready to run stock in the first place. I did not think having the train from one of my favourite films would happen so soon. If you're new to the channel, I have a whole playlist of other Tipfield Thunderbolt videos for you to go and check out. But for now, goodbye my dear friends. Drive trucks out, we who are about to die. Many thanks to my brilliant channel patrons Alex Goodman, GBH Train, D0280 Falcon, Sean Tempest, Random Thomas Fan. Dark White 73, Andrew Dyack, and Jude 72.